Welcome back to my channel. In this episode, Andrew Huberman interviews Chris Palmer, a medical doctor specializing in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Palmer is an expert in the relationship between metabolic and psychiatric disorders, and he shares his clinical and research experience using different forms of nutrition to treat various psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia, ADHD, OCD, anxiety disorders, and depression. Chris Palmer shares his story with Andrew Huberman about how he became interested in exploring the relationship between nutrition and mental health. Palmer had a history of mental illness that started with OCD as a child, and he had subsequent depression and suicidal thoughts. In medical school, Palmer was diagnosed with metabolic syndrome, and despite following a low-fat diet and exercising regularly, his condition continued to worsen. Palmer's doctor prescribed medication, but he decided to try the Atkins diet as a last resort. Within three months, his metabolic syndrome disappeared and his blood pressure, lipids, and weight normalized. This experience inspired Palmer to study the relationship between nutrition and mental health, which he believes can interact in a causal way over long periods of time. He realized that a low-carb or ketogenic diet has a powerful antidepressant effect. After experiencing success with the diet himself, he encouraged friends and family to try it, and they also experienced positive results. As a part of his clinical practice, he began to offer the diet to patients with treatment-resistant mental illness, and some of them also experienced a remarkable improvement in their mood. Palmer was initially hesitant to promote the diet because there were few clinical trials on its efficacy or safety, but he continued to offer it to his patients until he saw its potential as an effective treatment for depression. He observed that patients needed to achieve ketosis measured by urine strip for the diet to have a clinical benefit. Palmer talks about the patient with schizoaffective disorder who had daily auditory hallucinations and paranoid delusions. Despite trying 17 different medications, he couldn't stop his symptoms but gained a lot of weight due to medication side effects. In 2016, the patient asked Chris for help with weight loss and was recommended to try the ketogenic diet. Within two weeks, he started losing weight and noticed a dramatic antidepressant effect. Six to eight weeks later, he spontaneously reported that the voices he had been hearing for years had stopped. This unexpected improvement in the patient's psychiatric symptoms with the ketogenic diet surprised the psychiatrist and appended his understanding of psychiatric treatments. Huberman asked Palmer if this patient has been adhering to a ketogenic diet. Palmer said that the patient has remained on medication, but the dosage has been adjusted slowly over the years. Getting off medication is dangerous and it needs to be done under the supervision of a mental health professional or prescriber because the brain makes adaptations in response to psychiatric medications. The patient adherence to the ketogenic diet was not easy and it's rare for patients to follow the diet as instructed. In the case of this patient, the doctor was seeing him once a week and could do a lot of education, weigh him, check his ketones and glucose levels. Having an objective biomarker of compliance or non-compliance is beneficial in doing clinical work and research on this diet. The conversation highlights the importance of frequent contact and making micro and macro adjustments to medication or nutrition, which could be meaningful in improving adherence and patient outcomes. Andrew and Chris discuss the importance of measuring ketones and getting into ketosis for mental health. However, they acknowledge that not every patient needs a ketogenic diet and that simply getting rid of highly processed foods can make a huge difference in mood disorders. For patients with chronic mental disorders such as schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and Alzheimer's disease, Palmer recommends a ketogenic diet with reasonably high levels of blood ketones. He aims for blood ketone levels greater than 0.8 minimal for depression and greater than 1.5 for psychotic disorders and bipolar disorders. Huberman and Palmer discuss the historical use of ketogenic diets and fasting to treat epilepsy and how nutrition can be used as a tool to understand and treat mental illnesses. Huberman explains that for some people, the use of nutrition as a treatment tool for mental illness still falls under Wu signs. Palmer emphasizes that the ketogenic diet was actually developed in 1921 by a physician to treat epilepsy, not as a weight loss diet, and that fasting can stop seizures. He knows that while most people think going without food is bad and equate it with starvation, fasting has been used as a therapeutic intervention in almost every culture and religion for millennia. 
Palmer emphasizes that nutrition needs to be considered one of the major tools in the landscape of effective treatment and can be very effective, evidenced by the many miraculous transformations that have occurred. The conversation highlights the importance of considering nutrition as a tool in the treatment of neurological conditions. Palmer explains that the ketogenic diet is effective in improving insulin resistance, lowering glucose levels, and improving insulin signaling. However, the real magic of the diet, according to Palmer's research, lies in its ability to stimulate two processes related to mitochondria. The first is mitophagy, which is the process of getting rid of old and defective mitochondria and replacing them with new ones. The second is mitochondrial biogenesis, which means that over time the cells in the body and brain will have more and healthier mitochondria. He suggests that these two processes are the reason why the ketogenic diet is such a powerful treatment for epilepsy and chronic mental disorders. Palmer then discusses how nutrition changes can improve the symptoms of mental and neurological disorders. He mentions that nutritional psychiatry is a broad field that is still in its infancy, and while there are no large-scale trials documenting the efficacy of nutritional changes, case studies and mechanistic science papers suggest that they should work. Some of the disorders that can be improved with nutrition include chronic depression, PTSD, alcohol use disorder, Alzheimer's disease, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. Palmer also mentions a pilot study of 31 patients admitted to a French hospital with treatment-resistant mental disorders in which 28 patients were able to do the ketogenic diet and 100% had at least some improvement in symptoms with 46% having remission of illness. He concludes that using the ketogenic diet as a treatment for serious mental disorders is nothing new and that it's established evidence-based treatment for epilepsy. Andrew and Chris talks about the role of mitochondria in mental health. While mitochondria are often thought of as energy factories, they are also present in neurons and play a critical role in the production and regulation of neurotransmitters such as serotonin and dopamine. Palmer says that mitochondria also regulate epigenetics and are responsible for the expression of about 60% of the genes in a cell. Additionally, mitochondria play a role in all aspects of the human stress response. The discussion highlights how cutting-edge research in the fields of metabolism, aging, and neurology can lead to advancements in mental health treatment. Palmer then discussed mitophagy, which is the selective degradation of mitochondria by autophagy. He explains that autophagy is the process by which cells recycle old and damaged parts, which can be stimulated by fasting or calorie restriction. He highlights that autophagy is always occurring at the low level, but it can be hyper-stimulated by fasting or calorie restriction to induce longevity. The discussion then shifts to mitochondrial dysfunction, which is a term that has long been associated with everything that ails us, and it's often linked to aging, reactive oxygen species, and inflammation. Mitophagy plays a critical role in removal of dysfunctional mitochondria and ensuring that only healthy mitochondria are present in cells. Andrew and Chris explore the idea that reducing glucose levels in the brain is a common theme among these diets, including ketogenic diets and fasting. However, this idea is surprising given that neurons love glucose and studies have shown that high glucose levels in the brain lead to better representations of visual images. Palmer suggests that glucose levels may be a symptom rather than the real story and that mitochondrial dysfunction may be the most likely cause of dysregulation of glucose levels. He also notes that mitochondrial function plays a key role in glucose regulation throughout the body, including in the release of insulin from the pancreas. Andrew and Chris discuss the relationship between obesity, ketogenic diets, and mitochondria. They explore the idea that individuals who consume a moderate amount of carbohydrates may benefit from a lower glucose state, and that even those who are not following bad diet can experience the benefits of a ketogenic diet. Palmer suggests that while a ketogenic diet is an effective treatment, it doesn't necessarily mean that the cause of the problem was eating carbohydrates. He argues that the root cause of obesity is unknown and that multiple factors may be at play but believes that mitochondria could be the key to the obesity epidemic. Palmer gives an example of the effectiveness of the ketogenic diet in treating infant epilepsy and explains that dietary intervention can change brain metabolism and improve symptoms. While there is a debate on the causes of obesity, Palmer believes that there is a significant amount of evidence pointing to mitochondria's role. 
Andrew Huberman asked about the role of maternal DNA in the inheritance of mitochondrial DNA, and Chris Palmer clarifies that while mitochondria do come from the mother, the majority of proteins that make up mitochondria are actually encoded in the nuclear DNA and inherited from both parents. The discussion then shifts to the role of mitochondrial dysfunction in mental and metabolic illness and the various risk factors that contribute to it. Sleep disruption, high levels of stress and trauma and drug and alcohol use, including marijuana, all impair mitochondrial function. Chris Palmer explains that THC directly impairs mitochondrial function as it interacts with CB1 receptors on mitochondria. Studies have shown that chronic marijuana use can lead to premature aging and atrophy of brain tissue in areas with the greatest number of CB1 receptors. Despite the harmful effects of marijuana on mitochondrial function, Andrew Huberman knows that people may still choose to use it for its relaxing effects. However, it's important to understand that chronic use can harm overall mental and metabolic health, and there is always an opportunity to repair mitochondria and stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis. Palmer confirms that alcohol can disrupt glucose metabolism and reward pathways in the brain of alcoholics, leading to a chronic deprivation of energy. However, a study conducted by neuroscientist Nora Volkov and other researchers found that a ketogenic diet improved brain metabolism and reduced withdrawal symptoms, cravings, and neuroinflammation in alcoholics. The patients who received the ketogenic diet needed fewer benzodiazepines for their detox, and their brains showed improved metabolic function. While the study suggests that correcting brain metabolic defects caused by chronic alcohol use could help people be sober, there is a caveat. The study found that rats on the ketogenic diet had a five-fold increase in blood alcohol levels when exposed to the same amount of alcohol as rats on the standard diet. Therefore, the effects of alcohol on the brain might be different in people on a ketogenic diet. Huberman and Palmer then discusses brain imaging and ketones effect on Alzheimer's disease. PET scans show glucose hypometabolism in Alzheimer's patients, and some believe this is due to insulin signaling impairment. Stefan Conan's research found that ketone supplements corrected these brain metabolism deficits at least short term. In one pilot trial in a nursing home, cognitive improvement was observed when carbohydrate consumption was reduced at breakfast and lunch without a ketogenic diet. Andrew also shared his belief in directing carbohydrates to specific parts of the day for maintaining alertness. Andrew asked Chris whether exogenous ketones can be as beneficial as a ketogenic diet for mood disorders. Chris replies that there is no trial data to prove it and he speculates that it doesn't work. This is because the ketogenic diet involves more than just ketones such as improved glucose levels, insulin signaling, mitochondrial biogenesis, gut microbiome changes, and hormonal changes. Ketones may still be useful for metabolically healthy people and may be valuable for patients who cannot adhere to a strict ketogenic diet. There is a potential for using exogenous ketones with alcoholics as a substitute for alcohol. Then they discuss the role of glucose and ketones as fuel sources for the brain, specifically in the context of neuronal damage. Huberman posits that glucose and ketones are the brain's preferred fuel source and that if both are available, the brain will use ketones first. Palmer, however, notes that the brain's preferred fuel source is glucose and ketones, but some brain cells require glucose and cannot use ketones. When ketones are available, cells with varying degrees of metabolic health may use them as a fuel source, but metabolically compromised cells are more likely to use ketones to function at full capacity. This is important because when these cells have more energy, they can repair themselves and perform maintenance functions. Andrew and Chris discuss the potential benefits of the ketogenic diet for Alzheimer's and age-related cognitive decline. While there are many anecdotal reports and some animal studies showing promise, there are very few controlled clinical trials exploring the role of the ketogenic diet for the treatment or reversal of these conditions. A small pilot clinical trial with 26 subjects found statistically significant improvements in activities of daily living, quality of life, and cognitive function when patients were in ketosis. However, it didn't reach statistical significance. Some other small pilot trials of ketogenic diet in humans show that it improves biomarkers compared to low-fat or American Heart Association diets. The biggest challenge in studying the ketogenic diet's effects on Alzheimer's is recruiting participants to comply with the diet for the duration of the study. The difficulty in recruiting participants is one of the reasons why there are very few controlled clinical trials exploring the role of the ketogenic diet for Alzheimer's. 
Huberman and Palmer discuss the ketogenic diet and its potential benefits for weight loss. Palmer explains that inducing a state of ketosis is the goal of the ketogenic diet, which is achieved through carbohydrate restriction. For obese individuals, Palmer recommends a low-carbohydrate diet with less than 20 grams of carbs per day, which allows them to tap into their fat stores for energy. Palmer suggests avoiding artificial sweeteners and instead consuming natural sweeteners like stevia or monk fruit. Overall, the discussion highlights the importance of individualized dietary recommendations based on specific factors rather than one-size-fits-all approach to the ketogenic diet. Andrew and Chris talks about the combination of ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting in treating patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic depression. Palmer sometimes recommends a 3-4 to four day water fast to his patients to help them normalize their blood sugars, which has been successful in some cases. However, they both warn about the risk of hypomania, where individuals feel extraordinarily good and productive getting by on less sleep. Hypomania is a risk for psychiatric patients and can be caused by the ketogenic diet, but this side effect is not always seen as problematic. Huberman recommends behavioral tools, exercise, and supplements like inositol and magnesium for individuals who are struggling with sleep due to a low-carbohydrate diet. The discussion between Huberman and Palmer revolves around the impact of low-carbohydrate diets on the menstrual cycle and fertility, particularly in women. Palmer acknowledges that there is no one-size-fits-all answer and that there are polar opposite conclusions backed by science. He shares example of couples where men have an easier time with the ketogenic diet than women. Chris explains that the ketogenic diet mimics the fasting state, which may affect hormonal status and prevent pregnancy in women. However, he also acknowledges examples where women have benefited from the diet and even became pregnant. The discussion highlights the need for more controlled studies and data to better understand the bidirectional effects of low-carbohydrate diets on the endocrine system. Finally, Huberman asked Palmer about his thoughts on semi-glutide drugs and other GLP-1-related compounds, which are being evaluated for their efficacy to treat obesity. Palmer acknowledges that the drugs are highly effective at producing weight loss, but he's worried that they are not addressing the root cause of obesity, which he sees as metabolic derangement in the body or brain, possibly related to mitochondrial health and function. Palmer is skeptical that using a single process molecule to muck with human metabolism will be great for large numbers of people, and that he would rather see people control their type 2 diabetes through diet and lifestyle changes, as controlling it with a molecule has poor health consequences. He sees obesity as a symptom of metabolic derangement and believes that if we are to make any progress, we need to identify what is causing that derangement. This is it for this podcast. If you like my summary and content, please like, subscribe, and comment below. Stay tuned for more videos. Thank you, and I'll see you soon.